today I'm going to Delano, California to learn more about Cedar Chavez. I'm writing a speech and I want to go talk to people that knew him because I feel the more I learn about him, the more I'll get inspired. I heard that he was an animal activist like me and I feel like that's great because there's someone in my family who was an animal rights activist, so I feel it makes me more powerful if I have someone that was a very powerful activist in the world. Caesar and his family, they were farm workers themselves. So they lived the d difficult conditions, moving around from camp to camp and living out in their automobiles. And that was their life, moving from place to place and migrating. And so he saw the injustices that were taking place and how his father was treated in the fields and the disrespect. And, and he felt it as well, because he was out there working at a very young age to try to help the family make enough money. Caesar felt that kids had no place in the fields. They needed to be going to school. And, uh, you know, I was a young kid working in the fields. I know what that was like. Uh, and he realized that part of that would have to be, you know, child labor laws to protect, there were no laws that protected kids from working in the fields. Uh, so they were exposed to, to, to all the bad things that happened in the fields. People would ask Caesar. Why do farm workers follow you? Why do farm workers believe in you? And he used to reply to them, because I'm one of them, because I'm just like them. And I came from the same situations that they came from. He had to leave school at the eighth grade. He had to begin working at a very young age. All of his family had to begin working. They became migrants. They'd travel from place to place. And so he felt like, gosh, we're no different. And people believe that and they sensed that, and they felt comfortable around him, and they knew he wasn't there to try to sway them and get them to do something that they didn't want to do. He was trying to just give them enough confidence and hope and faith and belief that, look, if we come together, if we unite, we can beat these folks. We can have a decent uh, working conditions in the fields. We can have drinking water like everybody else should get when they're working. We can have restrooms in the fields. Our women don't have to form a circle out there in the field so they can go and utilize the restroom. How indignant is that for anybody, any human being? We don't have to work these hours from sunup to sundown without any breaks and, and so forth. We need, we're just like anybody else, we're human beings. And so people began to really believe and have faith and confidence in him. He said, this person is not out here for anything personal that he's trying to gain. He's not trying to make a lot of money. He's here because he believes in what we are, who we are, and what we do. And because of that, people followed him. You know, Caesar was always a big supporter of women, you know, in any position that they felt they could do. Uh, but if you took the position, then he treated you that you could do the position. But that made everyone better, you know. So, yeah, he was the leader. There were women in, 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 every, in all the parts of the union, up and down, you know, even the women at home taking care and feeding the families. Everyone had their role. Uh, but uh, as a woman, you know, working in the farm workers uh, at many different jobs, Caesar always had full respect. Um, he was always good to us. He was always good to me. The love for justice that is in us is not only the best part of our being, but it is also the most true to our nature. Cesar Chavez. A long time ago, 44 years ago, when I sang in that room, Caesar asked me to sing for the workers who were there. And so I sang with them, they joined in. It was this wonderful feeling of 
everyone feeling together and taking into their hearts the meaning of the song. To me, that's what I love most about music, is to sing something that means a lot, not just to me personally, although that matters too, but that connects me to other people. And so singing it today, I remembered back to when I was in that same room so long ago. One thing I remember about Cesar Chavez, when he would give a speech, it was different than other famous people I knew of who would give speeches. You know, the other ones, Martin Luther King or John F. Kennedy, would be very loud and, you know, vibrant and um, just something that was amazing. Cesar was amazing in a different way. When he would give a speech, and it could be to five people, you know, just talking in a room, or it could be to thousands of people, it was like he was talking one-to-one. -one. It was quieter, but there's a power in that quietness that is no less powerful than the louder speeches. No tenemos singing your song, We Shall Come, I was wondering, what do the lyrics mean to you? Oh. <laughs> they mean to me, when we are at our best, we are finding areas that we have in common, deep in our heart that we have in common, and that we can join together about to make a better world. And partly that's people of different races and different religions. Partly it's about people of, with all sorts of different lives. But what makes us human, you know, is the love in our hearts. And when there are people that come into our lives, like Caesar, someone who you can tell really is coming from that place of deep knowledge and conviction and honesty and bravery that's among the most special moments that ever happened those times stayed with me for years and years and sometimes I would live up to what I could be sometimes not as well as others but always he had set the bar really high and I, and I remember where it was and so it continues to inspire me to be the best kind of person I can be, to stand up for justice. I do believe we shall overcome Basis for peace is respecting all creatures. Cesar Chavez. Come here. Listen. I met him in Baltimore. I was a nun at the time. And we were having a social justice fair. And we invited all the people in Baltimore who helped other people, no matter what you did, come to the mother house and share what you do so we can help each other better. And that's where I met Pete. And he, at that time, was one of the neighborhood organizers. And when he came to the social justice fair that we were holding, he told us about it. And the nun said, oh, we've got to help him. He needs food and money and everything, everything. And he sent me down every week with those items. And after a year, I got organized. And that's how I got married.
<laughs> Caesar sent Pete to the uh, Bay Area. Every week, a truck went down to the Santa Maria area with um, money and food for the people down there. And uh, he was very good at that. Caesar had him teaching the students from the colleges in that area about the union, about why we would do what we do. The long day in the heat, uh, no bathrooms, just warm water to drink. And you could have no more than one glass of that from that tin cup. It was just nothing there to, to take care of human needs. I remember one time seeing a man having on his shoulder a big box filled with grapes. And guess how much money he made from taking it from the, the vine down to the um, main road where the things were put into a truck? 25 cents. That's what you got, 25 cents. Peter was sent from Baltimore back to Santa Maria. And there he was to teach the, the workers about their rights as workers. And while he was doing this, he was beaten by the workers of the grower. They dragged him from one end of the garden to the other by his neck. The another one had two dogs come to get him. Two big black dogs came and attacked him. Uh, he tells the beautiful story of how one day, it, one night, he always collected money outside one of the grocery stores, the big grocery store. And uh, he had forgotten his jacket. And it was cold and he was shivering. And this young man comes by and they say hello to each other and the young man goes down the street sidewalk. He turns around, comes back, takes his jacket off and puts it around Pete. I was at a group of people one day and told them this story. And I said, I wonder where that young man is today. And with that, a hand went up and everybody went, oh, <laughs> they were so pleased with him. And Eloy said, yes, it was me. I'm the one that did it. I loved you then. Caesar was a vegetarian, and when my husband was diagnosed with colon cancer, Caesar said, you're going on a macrobiotic diet. And of course, I knew who else had to do it too, because I certainly couldn't eat meat in front of him if he can't eat it. And I uh, gave him, and the nurse told us after Pete passed away that that diet gave Pete four years of life. So that was very good. We need in a special way to work twice as hard to make all people understand that animals are fellow creatures, that we must protect them and love them as we love ourselves. And that the basis, the basis for peace, the basis for peace is respecting all creatures. That's the basis for peace. And that we cannot, we cannot hope to have peace until we respect everyone, respect ourselves, and respect animals and all living things. And that's the basis, we think, the beginning of peace. We cannot, we know we cannot, def we cannot defend and be kind to animals until we stop exploiting them. Exploiting them in the name of science, exploiting animals in the name of sport, exploiting animals in the name of fashion, and yes, exploiting animals in the name of food. There is no such thing as defeat in nonviolence. Cesar Chavez. Our movement has been supporting lesbian and gay rights for over 20 years. Cesar uh, supported gay rights in the 70s, and this is not when it was a trendy matter, you know, this, uh, supporting gay rights in the 1970s, uh, you know, w was not a particularly 
popular position to take, but he believed that uh, how can you uh, struggle for equality and opportunity uh, for your own people when you deny uh, legal rights to anyone else? My grandmother went to my dad and said, you, know, you can't go to school anymore, you need to help feed your, your brothers and sisters. And so he, like many other young farm workers, he dropped out of school and worked in the fields. But he always had this insatiable appetite for knowledge. And he read, and he was a voracious reader. If you want to know about a person, look at their library. You know, we're here in my father's library, and, and right behind us we have the complete writings of Mahatma Gandhi that talk about sacrifice and, and those things that we should aspire to be and to accomplish in life. Caesar had an eclectic reading interest. Uh, for a guy with a seventh grade education, he was very well educated, but self-educated, and he read everything Gandhi wrote. A whole shelf of books is a complete work of Mahatma Gandhi in paperback. They're all dog-eared. And then over here he has the complete writings of Peter Drucker that talk about modern management techniques. And so on the surface you would think that, well, what, what do they have to do in common with each other? And the fact is by themselves they may not, but if you're a person that, 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 that believes that the world should be a better place and that we should live to a higher standard, but you know that progress is only made doing the daily work, then it makes all the sense in the world. And that was my father. He read about Gandhi's fasting and he carefully followed Dr. King's career from the Montgomery boycott. So his commitment to nonviolence, you know, as was the case with the major innovations that he pioneered, many of which were pretty foreign to the labor movement in that day, was based upon a philosophical commitment. You know, Caesar believed that human life is a precious thing, a gift from God, and no one has a right to take it for any reason or any cause, no matter how just it might be. Remember the times, this is the 60s, the Vietnam War is raging, there's civil unrest, and he believed that the American people were yearning for an alternative to, to violence, and that if they saw the poorest of the poor appealing to them uh, nonviolently, that they would respond. He called the American people our court of last resort, and they were. I'm going to see the room where Cesar Chavez fasted, and I have a lot of mixed emotions about it. I want to feel what it feels to sit in a room where he fasted, and that means a lot to me. I'm going to take the little ones. Okay. As I was walking in, you could just feel an energy that was just pretty intense. It was really overwhelming. So I just decided to pick the little ones up and just get them out, just take them out with me. Mom, I was wondering if I could be alone. Yes, sweetheart, sure. I'll be outside waiting for you, okay? Genesis is in the same room that Cesar Chavez was in fasting for 36 days. Um, she asked me to leave, and at first I didn't know what I should do, but I decided to go ahead and give her some time to herself. Um, I'm a little bit worried, but I have a feeling she'll be okay in there. So those of us around him, some getting weaker each day. When the doctors began to get concerned, about potential permanent damage, talking to him and saying, you know, Dad, there's a lot of battles to be fought still, and you don't do anybody any good if you're not able to lead this movement. But understanding at the end of the day that it was such a personal thing that it was his decision to make alone, and so, so you have to come to terms with that. But in coming to terms with that, what you do is you begin to look at your own commitment and the things that you've done, and it becomes a very powerful thing, not just for family members, but for everybody, because the idea is that if you have a man here that's willing to undergo that pain and sacrifice and suffering for something he believes in, what are we prepared to do? I'm writing a speech, and Cesar Chavez taught me that 
if he can do it, I can make a change too because you can be any age to use your voice. You can just think of what he went through and how he didn't let anyone stop him. So just always, whenever you think something is right, follow your heart and stick with what you think is right. So I can put some of that stuff in my speech. When I was three years old, my favorite food was chicken nuggets. I asked my mom, Mom, where did my chicken nuggets come from? She looked at me and she said, from the grocery store. What? We eat animals, Mom? I never want to eat meat ever again. Let's help the earth and all living beings on this planet by making conscious choices about the foods we eat and let the healing begin. Thank you. Yeah.